yeah, one day I'll be riding camels in Dubai and the next, uh, you know, in the Swiss Alps flying drones. Someone who writes, you know, $20 million check, go make Jurassic Park number six <laughs> right, and right. call me after we've made 50 million. I felt I was destined to be a rock star and I just felt like this is, this is for me. This is my destiny. For some reason, you took a turn. How did you decide to move on from this pursuit? And I had the opportunity to pass our record along to Ryan Wright, who is a big time Sony music executive. He doesn't like the look. He'd yeah. never played on the radio. The songwriting yeah. needs work. <laughs> yeah. I took everything he said to heart and then we got really huge, we got signed, and now I'm the next big thing, right? Hi, and welcome to the Reiterate Show. Thanks for giving us a watch or a listen from wherever you are in the world. Our goal with this show is to introduce you to people who have gone through setbacks in their lives while they pursue happiness and fulfillment. Through these interviews and these conversations, hopefully you'll see that we are all capable of bouncing back and achieving greatness. Enjoy the conversation. Here we are with a longtime friend of mine, professional musician, professional filmmaker, world traveler, international man of mystery, Jared Palick. How you doing? Hey, David, thanks for having me on, man. Really excited. Hey, I appreciate you being guest number one on this on this podcast. It really means a lot. I feel like you and I go, you know, back quite a ways. I think your story is very interesting. I think that you have learned a ton in the last decade or two. I'm excited to jump into your story a little more and explore that with you. But For sure. uh, as kind of a warm up, as kind of an introduction, maybe give uh, give us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you're working on currently and that type of thing. Yeah, so i uh, just been working on a lot of different film projects uh, around the world. Uh, just kind of been traveling a bunch, uh, getting to shoot in a lot of really cool uh, remote spots, which has been exciting. Um, I'm currently uh, a full-time producer, filmmaker, uh, creative director, uh, just working on branded uh, video projects, film, TV shows for just some of the biggest corporations around the world. So it's it's really exciting. Amazing. Now, you said you are a producer and a creative director. Now, in my mind, a producer is someone who writes, you know, $20 million check, go make, uh, go make Jurassic Park number six and <laughs> right. call me after we've made 50 million. Maybe describe, help me understand, what is, it, what is an executive producer? It's a very generic title, <laughs> to say the least. I mean, you could be a producer and be like, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg and just cut a check for a movie to be made. Or your producer who pretty much from start to finish, you come up with the concept, you shoot the film yourself, you edit it yourself, you distribute it yourself. So, uh, I mean, to an extent, it's just a generic title that means that uh, you do whatever it takes to get the job done. And so sometimes I'm wearing many different hats. Uh, sometimes I'm literally just an assistant on a film set as a director is yelling at me and telling me what to do. And sometimes I'm on set and I'm telling people what to do. So it varies from day to day, but for the most part, my day to day looks like I you know, meet with a client and they say, hey, we've got this idea, we wanna accomplish this goal to reach our target audience. And I say, great, here's what we can do to accomplish those uh, you know, different tasks that you have. And then kind of just see it from concept all the way through um, creation and distribution of, of a video project. So kind of just oversee the whole, the whole process from start to finish. Amazing. Now, as I have understood, you are working on multiple projects at a time. Is that right? Yeah. As opposed to maybe being employed by a big production house and you're on one yeah. movie for two years. It sounds to me like you've got a lot going on. Yeah. The feature film world is definitely a little bit different than corporate and even television. So yeah, feature film, you might spend years and that's your one gig until it finishes up. For the most part, I'm usually trying to keep a bunch of different projects going simultaneously. TV shows that I'll work on will, you know, take anywhere from, you know, six to eight months and then one-off corporate gigs and, and uh, kind of branded projects, whether it's like a TV commercial, a social media video. Those usually take maybe a month uh, to film, shoot, and edit. So 
Just gotta keep, keep the projects rolling in and stay busy, right? Yeah, amazing. It sounds like you are, um, you're based here in the US, but that hasn't always been the case. The last number of years you were living abroad um, yeah. and it sounds like you're racking up the traveler, the airline miles. Yeah, for sure. You're, and you're in Wisconsin currently, but where have you been in the last handful of years? Yeah, currently living in uh, Milwaukee with my amazing wife, Brittany, and uh, you know she works on a lot of different projects with me. She's a creative director herself and, and does a lot of amazing things with production work. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, been racking up the travel miles for sure, uh, getting to go to a lot of exciting places. I do a lot of uh, travel and tourism uh, production work for hotels and, and uh, different departments of tourism for other governments. So. Yeah, one day I'll be riding camels in Dubai and the next, uh, you know, in the Swiss Alps flying drones or uh, just recently got to shoot on the Great Wall of China and that was amazing. So have certainly been able to have some crazy adventures. So you produced the paperwork and then they backed down and you were able to, able to proceed with the project or did it take more it than just... Well, it's interesting you say because they didn't care what our paperwork was. So I've got the drone in the air and I'm like, okay, I've got to get this shot. They're about to ground me and shut me down. So I hit record and quick thinking, I'm like, I'm gonna film it in reverse and fly the drone backwards to you know, help appease these police officers while still getting the shot. And then when we play it in reverse, it'll look like I'm going up to the Oriental Pearl. So hit record, flew it reverse, brought it back, landed it, and it got the shot and it worked out. So. <laughs> Uh, you never, yeah, you never know what's gonna happen, but you gotta prepare for the worst, right? Huh, amazing. So, you haven't been doing this your whole career. Um, you know, take me back a little bit for the first part. You came out of high school. What were the hopes and dreams? What were you working on at that point? Yeah, so, I mean, growing up, I was really into arts and creativity and uh, got my first guitar in, in grade school, middle school. And from that point forward, I mean, I, I felt I was destined to be a rock star. I mean, that was every day jamming in my room to Oasis, uh, Wonderwall, or who knows whatever uh, rock group I loved in high school. And I just felt like this is, this is for me. This is my destiny. I wanna be a professional musician. I wanna you know, write music that inspires people. And so pretty much all through high school and then through, uh, especially in college, got really serious into music. And that was, uh, you know, quickly became pretty much my full-time thing. So in middle school, high school, were you a band kid? Were you, uh, you know, playing all the instruments or was this more of an after school with your buddies rocking out and writing songs? Yeah, definitely after school writing songs. I'd goof around at school and get in trouble, and then afterwards uh, just go home and play play in a garage band with all my friends. So it definitely was my after school passion project. And then same in college, you know, I, I went to school and studied audio engineering to kind of stay in the music uh, as I kind of looked for a way to you know still provide a, a lucrative uh, financial benefit for me. Um, but yeah, pretty much nine to five every day when I wasn't working, just playing in a garage, rocking out, you know, jamming out with friends. And that was what I wanted to do. I just wanted to be a musician and I had, I had like my heart set like, this is what success will look like for, for me. If I'm touring internationally and I'm playing in front of huge crowds and I've got, you know, major record label distribution. This is success and this is the only way I can see my career and my life going and nothing else. And I pretty much just was heart and soul into it 100%. And how long did that, was that the goal? I mean, you pursued that for how many years? Yeah, probably for the better part of uh, 15 years. Um, I mean, I started getting really serious about music um, in college, early in college, and then even after college, uh, after I got married, um, my wife played in the band with me and she's an incredible piano player. And so that was kind of my thing. That was what I felt like was the only career path for me and I couldn't see myself doing anything else. And even along the way, I had a lot of other really great successes. I had a very successful recording studio uh, that I did for a while. But it, in my mind, it was always just a subsidiary of my ultimate dream, right? To be the professional rock star and everything else that I did 
was in support of that goal and that focus. And I refused to deviate from that path, you know, for the, for the better part of 15 years. So you guys wrote albums and produced music and put it out into the industry and you shopped around. Did you go on tour? Did you get signed? I don't know what that means. Did you, you know? <laughs> Yeah, so great questions. I played with a bunch of incredible musicians, both in college and then after college living in Oregon. And we recorded a bunch of different albums, you know, would drive around uh, in a van to, uh, you know, different cities and, and play shows and had, you know, a somewhat small local following in the different communities where we lived and where we played. Um, but I guess we were never really signed to a record label who said, hey, here's a bunch of cash, make us some records, and then uh, essentially we'll distribute them and, and put you on TV or put you on the radio. So we were, we were very much independent. Uh, but yeah, but I put my heart and my soul and my you know, financial stability at risk just for the sole purpose of trying to you know, further my musical career. Uh, to the, to the, sometimes to the deficit of everyone around me and everyone who was also in the band. <laughs> so when you were playing shows and touring and you had records produced, was this success in your mind? Had you made it at that point? That's a great question. In my mind, I would say no, because when I would look at the, the bands who I really followed and loved and their level of success and I saw what they were doing, I think to myself, man, I'm not there yet. I'm not to their level. I'm not selling out Wembley in England. I'm not playing for tens of thousands of people. You know, I'm, I'm barely even heard of, which obviously is ridiculous to think because you know it's so far and few between to, to have that level of success. But in my mind, I was, I thought, you know, I can do this. I can work hard. I can create, and I can reach the masses, even if it's to a smaller extent. Uh, you know, and just have, you know international tours for uh, for major crowds. I didn't stop to enjoy the roses along the way and I certainly didn't really take a moment to just take in all the fun and the excitement. I was too busy thinking about the next thing and what I had to do. And it's interesting looking back now to the detriment of my bandmates. I, I played with so many amazing drummers and bass players and guitar players, piano players and they'd give amazing input and feedback and I just, I was very close-minded. I had to do things my way. I saw in my mind what was the only path to success as I saw it. And so I refused to really let anybody into my uh, cohesive atmosphere of, of this trajectory for what I called success. And looking back to the detriment, I mean, I definitely didn't enjoy it. I'm sure I made it painful for a lot of people. Uh, simply because it, it started to lose its fun and its passion. It started to lose its creativity simply because it was now a driving machine that I was dedicated to move along until I reached this, you know, unreachable, unattainable level of success in my mind. So you pursued this dream for many years. You worked hard. Yeah. It sounds like it was a grind every day. You'd write songs, write music, record music, went to school to learn how to record music. It seems like yeah. all of the pieces of the puzzle that one would need to have a successful yeah. band from an outsider's point of view were there. But for some reason, you took a turn. How did you decide to move on from this pursuit? Yeah, interesting you point that out, David. I never really thought about that before, but certainly all the pieces were in place uh, for us to have a really successful music career. Um, and as I reflect back around that time, you know, we had just recorded an album and uh, we're looking to take it on the road, shop it around to labels, see if we could get somebody to, to sign us. And I had the opportunity to pass our record along to Ryan Wright, who is a big time Sony music executive. And he's worked with some of the biggest and brightest in the industry and all over the radio. And I thought, this is it. This is our big ticket to, to talk to someone in the industry and, and maybe they'll sign us, right? In my head, I'm thinking this. And uh, we get on the phone and really, really nice guy, amazing human being. And he just says to me, you know, do you want me to be honest with you? And do you want some constructive criticism? And I said, absolutely. So he says to me, you know, your sound is great. You guys sound really good. Your music is solid. And I can see your genre being very, you know, niche, having a, a very cult following uh, in the people that listen to your music. But it's not mainstream marketable. It's nothing that I would put on the radio. 
Uh, it's nothing that I would be able to market. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done with your look and with the writing and the lyrics. And, uh, and the whole time he's saying this, I'm just thinking, wow, I was not expecting that. <laughs> it was just very raw and uh, no one had ever really given me feedback like that. And one of the things that I started to recognize was, wow, I, I think I've closed myself off so much to feedback and input from my amazing bandmates and friends who have ever given constructive criticism and kind of just lived in my own world where I thought it has to be this way, it's the only way to do it, and just self-sabotaging myself in that respect. And once Ryan uh, gave me that feedback, it started to kind of sink in. I wasn't 100% like, okay, I'm completely defeated, I wanna die, you know. I felt like I needed to kind of take a look at what he had to say and start to evaluate the direction. And so it kind of started an interesting shift in what I was gonna do next in my life. So you get off the phone with this Sony music executive who just told you that after your 15 years of work, hundreds of songs written, hours of shows played, hundreds of miles touring around the country, playing show after show after show, he right. tells you you're not marketable, he doesn't like the look, he'd yeah. never played on the radio, the songwriting yeah. needs work. <laughs> yeah. To me, that sounds like that would just crush my soul. It was crushing, <laughs> that's for sure. I think there were two to three weeks of uh, you know, binge eating and watching TV and uh, certainly just feeling sorry about myself. I definitely felt pretty crushed and also felt like, gosh, what am I doing with my life? And uh, you know, what, what has been the point of these last 10 to 15 years? Like, was all this work for naught? And just, yeah, I was definitely feeling very hopeless at that point. Now, did, sure. you, did you believe him? Did you say, I can see his point? Did you accept that feedback and think to yourself, I'm gonna turn it around, I'm gonna become marketable, I'm gonna change my, I'm gonna shave my head, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to be <laughs> what this guy describes? What were you thinking about his feedback? Yeah, I definitely felt crushed. I mean, this would be like the perfect underdog story, right? If I said, I took everything he said to heart and then we got really huge, we got signed and now I'm the next big thing, right? Not the case. Um, I didn't take what he said to heart. Um, I more so just felt hurt that, you know, he didn't want to sign us and that he didn't have like an exciting opportunity for us uh, to work from. And so I, I felt crushed and felt depressed, but j definitely did not take his feedback to heart at all. I just kind of felt like, nah, like I'm still meant to do this. I just, I don't understand how, I don't know what to do. I'm not sure what my purpose is, uh, but I still felt like music is my career and this is what I have to do. Like this is what success will look like. And so I, I, I felt pretty confused with what to do and what direction to go at that point. So a couple weeks go by, you're binge eating Ben and Jerry's every night, <laughs> you know, watching Netflix episode after episode. And were you by yourself in like a pit of despair and just not getting out of bed? What was the state? Who was around you? How did these days go back then? Yeah, my amazing wife being the incredible person uh, who she was, uh, you know, was there with me and she had the, uh, the idea, you know, let's just keep pursuing music and let's use our talents, uh, you know, to the best of their ability. And so she started looking at getting us an agent to start performing overseas. So, um, so in... she didn't believe Ryan either. That's a great question. I think she's, she certainly uh, believed Ryan and took his feedback and input, but knew that I was like, I was 100% dedicated and convinced that music was our career and our future. And so she amazingly enough supported me through all of this and was willing to, you know, just continue to try and pursue that dream with me. So she being, uh, you know, the more intelligent one uh, in the relationship thought, well, let's continue to make a career out of this. Let's keep making money and let's try and be successful no matter what. So she uh, looks for an agent for us to start touring uh, internationally and playing uh, kind of the cruise ship and hotel markets, um, doing cover bands or jazz bands or lounge bands. 
And so, uh, yeah, we landed an agent in LA and uh, then for the next two years started traveling the world as uh, jazz musicians, uh, playing in you know five-star hotels, amazing cruise ships, uh, and doing this professional international music gig thing. And it's interesting because, you know, we're making really good money at this point um, and getting to travel to some amazing places, uh, playing with amazing musicians. But in my head, the whole time I'm thinking, okay, this is great, this is a side hustle, this isn't my full-time gig, and I'm still gonna be like a touring professional musician, and in my spare time, I'm gonna write songs that are gonna be hits, and I'm gonna keep sending stuff to the labels to try and get signed, completely ignoring like the reality of like this amazing opportunity we have right in front of us, traveling, playing music, making thousands of dollars every month to get to just jam out in amazing places, but I just can't enjoy it. And it becomes almost a toxic environment for me because every day I wake up and I think to myself, all right, I'm gonna write a song today. I've got my recording gear with me. Everywhere we'd go, I'd bring my little microphone and, and amplifier set up to, to write music. And I just, I couldn't write anything. I had complete writer's block. And it became so toxic that I just didn't even wanna play music anymore because I couldn't write, I couldn't be creative. And I kept telling myself, like, this is the only way I will be successful is if I'm in a, uh, you know, a professional rock band, touring, writing my own music, and traveling the world as a, you know, as a rock band, right? And here I am traveling the world with my wife in five-star hotels, getting paid to like play a couple sets every night for you know magistrates and kings of different countries. But no, that's that's not success, right? Because it doesn't look the way that I t keep telling myself that it has to look. So I reach a point where I just, I can't write music anymore. I, I you know, go, go to work every night, jam out the gig, the jazz gig, come home, and I just, I don't even wanna touch my guitar. And it, and it was painful, David. It was, it was really hard to still be a professional musician simply because of my mindset and where I told myself I had to be. So a number of years goes by where it sounds like you are in a depressed state. Yeah. How do you pull yourself out of that? What changed? How did you turn that corner to start the path where you are at now? Over these years of, of traveling abroad and, and playing, I, I start to slowly take a look at what Ryan said, and I start to look at some of these amazing musicians who I'd played with in bands, both in college, when I'm living in Utah, in Oregon, uh, when I'm playing professionally there, and I'm looking at all these other musicians who we had the opportunity to play with overseas, and I start to think, wow, like I really lived in a box and I really put myself in a place where I refused to hear feedback from anybody else. I refused to acknowledge that the way that I wanted to do things been the wrong way, right? It could have not been the correct way uh, for us to be successful. And some of these things started to sink in and I started to think, man, if, if I want to be creative and if I want to be successful um, doing what I love, I'm maybe going to need to start to open my mind, right? I didn't know what that would look like or how I would do that, but I definitely reached a level of depression where I started to really reflect and look at my life and start to evaluate, you know, what truly made me happy and what success really looked like, right? So, we're uh, overseas in the Middle East. We're living in Oman in this five-star hotel. And I wake up one morning again. I, I'm at a point where I can't even touch my, my guitar to write anymore because it's just, there's nothing to it. Nothing comes. So one morning I wake up and I've got a little DSLR camera uh, that I have. And I like taking photos and it was kind of fun to just go around and take pictures. Having been on the other side of, uh, of film, you know, working in the music industry, I've written music for film and um, edited sound for TV and for film. Um, kind of was more just like a little passion project. So I pick up my camera and I start video record different places around the resort, people having fun, people doing things, and it's exciting. And I get really excited to wake up every day and take my little camera and go around and uh, make a little home video, a little home vlog. And it started to really spark the creativity again for me in a way that I hadn't felt in a long time. And it was really exciting. So it was like this new thing, you know? 
Yeah, so it sounds like you had, you had another medium that you could create with. It sounds like it was almost a little bit of a toy. Yeah. Whereas previously you were looking at your guitar like your job, like, you know, yeah. you had to pick it up, you had to write songs. Whereas a camera gave you an outlet for your creativity in a, in a vertical that you hadn't spent much time in. Yeah, definitely. It definitely became like this thing for me that was an outlet. And even if I was working on a project with it, for example, you know, the uh, marketing department at the hotel uh, asked me uh, to make a little promo video for them. They saw me running around with my camera and I had a little drone. And so they asked me to make them a little promotional video. And I did and they put it online and it got a ton of feedback, a great feedback and people loved it. And I started to think, wow, like this is really exciting. And it started to feel like in a way for me, like what I wasn't getting from playing guitar and writing music anymore. And it was this new outlet, this new interesting thing that started to rejuvenate me and make me feel alive again. And really got me thinking like, huh, what's so different about this than, you know, this passion and this direction of success that I was feeling driven towards in music that felt so hard, so difficult and so forced. Whereas like making these little home videos and doing stuff for the marketing department came really easy. So during the day times, you don't have gigs, you're not playing shows during the day, so you're out in these beaches on these resorts and you're flying your drone, taking photos, but at the same time, you have to play shows in the evenings. You have to pick up that guitar. Yeah. Does the creativity of writing songs come back to you? Yeah, that's an interesting question um, because, you know, in the midst of running around with my camera and, and having a lot of fun making little home videos and vlogs and flying my drone around, I definitely started to become more excited about playing music at night. Creativity felt like it was flowing more easily. And I think it started to really bring me out of this depressed state where I felt like, you know, I could only have this career as a rock star traveling the world uh, and touring and started to recognize like, wow, like I, just enjoy being creative. I just enjoy um, the arts, the excitement of making something from nothing and started to really bring to home uh, kind of the, the choices that I had made leading up to that point. I spent a lot of time reflecting on the past 15 years, what I called all of my failed attempts to be successful, right? and started to really evaluate what I had done and look at it in a different light and through a different lens, starting to really respect and understand the people who I had worked with and the in incredible talents that I had been surrounded with through my mu music career and kind of looking at the directions they had gone with their lives and started to realize, you know, it's possible that success can have many different faces and can look like a lot of different things, right? I started to realize, okay, if I were to manage my expectations and really start to respect the process and look at the trials I had been through, I started to kind of see that there were more than, I kind of started to see that there is more than one way to be successful, right? So simultaneously, all these things are happening. We're wrapping up our music tours overseas. We're come, gonna be coming back to the United States. I'm pondering whether I continue this uphill, begrudging drive towards what I call, you know, touring music success that just felt so hard to do, or to pursue creativity in a different way that I hadn't really expected, doing video, uh, making films, and try something different that excited me, you know, was work and uh, I still had to get up every day and, and work at it. Um, but it didn't feel forced and things started to come more easily. So this really started to open up my, kind of my understanding and my perspective on what success was and started to really see what my downfall had been for all those years, you know, so many amazing opportunities I had to play, to tour, to travel, but I just let those things pass by, not, not enjoying them not even taking a moment to really just bask in the creativity with all these amazing, talented musicians who I've got to spend time with throughout my life. And so definitely had some reflective moments in Oman and overseas and then coming back to the US for sure. Has your perspective on fulfillment changed if you think back from 15 years ago compared to now? Certainly. Uh, I certainly look back 
and see that because of my expectations for what I thought my life had to look like, I spent a lot of time not being fulfilled because I kept telling myself I haven't reached that pinnacle of success yet. And so in reality, there were so many amazing things happening. I was able to do so many incredible things, but I, I kept myself miserable and unfulfilled through all those experiences simply because I kept saying, no, you haven't made it yet. You gotta keep pushing, you gotta keep working, and you gotta keep trying. And looking back, I can see that had I managed my expectations and allowed myself to really enjoy opportunity as it came in whatever form it was and whatever it looked like, I could have really gotten more fulfillment out of life, not only that, but also could have found opportunities to grow my career without self-sabotaging myself because I would say it has to look like this. And if it doesn't look like this, then it's not success, right? I look at struggle and you know, I really see struggle as a gift and in every struggle that we have in life, there's a gift that comes from it. And I've recognized now that the more I embrace the gift out of struggle, the more I'm able to allow life and the universe to correct my course and to push me in a direction with which I'm supposed to go, right? Because if we look at failed opportunities and we look at struggles and we say, hey, I can see what's working and I can see what's not working. Let's evaluate our circumstance and let's evaluate what the technical challenges that we're facing are and use those to fuel us and to propel us into continued success rather than seeing a struggle as a wall, right? Oftentimes we'll see any type of difficulty or consequence as, oh, we hit a roadblock, right? How often do we hear that word, David? Like, I hit a roadblock. Struggle isn't supposed to stop you. It's supposed to redirect you and allow you to overcome those challenges and to keep moving and propel you towards success. There's a book that I absolutely love called The Founder's Dilemma. And they go through a lot of case studies with some of the most famous entrepreneurs um, and uh, industry moguls uh, that the world has seen and talks about the challenges that they've had. And they always talk about a struggle is always meant to be a fork in the road and not a, not a block in the road, right? Whenever you have something come up that is a challenge, you're supposed to evaluate and then say, where do we course correct and which direction do we go, right? Well, for so many years, I would hit a roadblock and I would say, the only way to go is straight. Let's just keep pushing through the challenge. Let's keep pushing through the hardship. Let's not redirect the course whatsoever and just keep pushing head on. And had I really understood and learned from those struggles that they were opportunities to redirect, I feel like I could have course corrected so much quicker. However, I look back at those, you know, 15 years in, in you know, what may have been a failed music career really as an opportunity for growth. And I look back and call that my 15 year struggle to really find what, what I was passionate about and allow myself to understand that, you know what, I really am just a creative person. And if I can be creative, I can be successful. Now my creativity doesn't have to look like a rock band. It doesn't have to look like a huge feature film producer. It doesn't have to look like any one specific thing anymore. As long as I'm doing what I'm passionate about and I'm able to still be creative, I've come to understand that I'm successful. And it really has allowed me to enjoy what's happening in the moment, to be grounded, and to take in life every day and just appreciate the opportunities that come by, whereas in the past I may have just let those things flow by and not even open the window to look out at the beauty around me simply because I was so focused. It's true, it's, you know, I really uh, admire the people who at age eight knew exactly what they wanted to be and then stayed the course for 15, 20 years and they look back and think, I always wanted to do this. I always wanted to be a doctor. But one might say that it's unreasonable to have an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 16-year-old or a 21-year-old or a 29-year-old know exactly what they want to do for the rest of their life. Yeah, it's true. So yeah, it took you 15 years to realize, actually, I just want to be creative and, it, and the medium can be multiple. Absolutely. I look at adaptability, you know, for, for the people who have a dream when they're young and they want to pursue exactly what they want to pursue. 
Adaptability is really one of the, the key elements to them being successful, right? In my circumstance, I refused to be adaptable. I refused to change my course and I insisted on doing things the way that I wanted to do them. And so regardless of whether you're open to change in your life or you're 100% set on that career path and that direction that you wanna go, being willing to take constructive criticism, be adaptable, change course as needed, but to continue in the direction that you wanna go is really key to you know, achieving success in whatever it is that you wanna do in life and finding joy. And I certainly feel like I'm in a place now where I try to be as adaptable as possible. I try to uh, evaluate every circumstance in the moment and see where life is directing me and being open to change and not having expectations for what I think my life has to look like or is supposed to look like and instead just take it in and course correct as needed when opportunity comes. So if you love struggle so much, <laughs> if you could go back to that week when you spoke with that Sony executive and you could whisper yeah. into your own ear something, yeah. would you do it? What would you say? I absolutely would. I would say, listen, just listen to Ryan, to my band, to my wife, to others, I would just, I would just, you know, it's funny, you look back and you just wanna shake yourself and say, what were you thinking, right? Obviously I needed those struggles to get to where I am now because otherwise I never would've learned. But I would've told myself to just listen, to be open to others' opinions, to be open to insights, and to just manage my expectations, right? If, if I could write a book for myself, it would be managing expectations. Because for so long, I've had an expectation of what things are supposed to be like. And looking back, if I could tell myself, just open up your expectations to something different, to what your life could look like, if it changed and wasn't how you thought it would be, could you find joy and happiness? And, and at the time, I told myself, no, I'm not happy unless my life looks like this. But in reality, we can find joy in anything, right? If you're an accountant and you love what you do, you can find joy. If you're an athlete, if you have a mundane job, if you're an electrician, there are so many amazing jobs out there and you can love what you do and you can be passionate about it and truly feel joy and success in your life. But you just have to manage your expectations, right? It's awesome. I, I don't know for sure, but I kind of think that the title, Managing Expectations, is probably already taken by a book, <laughs> right. so you might have to choose something different. But, I think so, I think that's a good point. <laughs> but it doesn't have my face on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, amazing, Jared, thank you. Uh, quick question or two more for you. Are you reading books right now? What are you reading? Yeah, definitely, definitely love business books because I have to travel a lot, I always, Love to grab a good, uh, you know, self-help or uh, educational business book to read on the plane. One that I love that I'm rereading right now, which is one of my favorites, is actually called uh, The Gift of Struggle. And we talked about uh, struggle a little bit. And uh, it's by a gentleman named Bobby Herrera. Amazing book. I mean, any entrepreneur or business person or leader in their industry, I feel like should read uh, The Gift of Struggle. It's really a great guide to um, being a better boss, uh, being a better human and uh, just accomplishing more in your life, uh, for sure. I, it's, it's a great book, love it. And then what about music? I mean, do you still stay up on the new bands? What are you listening to lately? Definitely, I still love to play my guitar. Uh, not so much touring and traveling and performing anymore, but uh, yeah, I love to jam out. Um, I'm really into jazz. I just love to just uh, just get Alexa or Google to throw on some, some jazz and just lounge around the house. But I mean, I'll still throw on some uh, some punk rock from time to time and uh, jam out like in my high school days. So I I'm, into, I'm into whatever, but yeah, I definitely love having music, music on in the background while I hang out. Perfect, and if people want to connect with you, where can they find you? Yeah, um, if they want to reach me online, they can uh, just head to jaredpalick.com, which is my first and last name, J-A-R-E-D-P-A-L-I-C-K.com. And I uh, got a bunch of cool videos on there, and if anyone ever wants help or you know needs resources for filmmaking or just wants to chat you know I, I love to you know discuss business and I consider myself a uh, a serial entrepreneur of creativity I just like to 
chat business about anything creative and any endeavor that someone has going on. And so I also like to encourage others and see others really thrive and shine. So don't hesitate to reach out. Perfect. Jared, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being on podcast number one of the Reiterate podcast. It's Love been hearing awesome. your story. Love looking back at the last couple decades with you. Thank you again. Great. We'll see you later.